we have a new vision and with it a renewed focus. Work to develop this has been underway for some time, but when COVID-19 struck, it would have been easy to pause, to rethink, to retreat, but we didn't and we won't. Mental health, global heating and infectious diseases. These are the three most urgent health challenges we face and discovery research, going to the edge of today's knowledge and then beyond, will bring totally new insights, which can and will bring unforeseen benefits to everyone. To do all of this, we also need to change how we fund science, and we need science to change with us. We want the broadest range of people to contribute to and benefit from science's ability to change the world. And this is just the start. I hope you will join us as we embark on our most ambitious journey yet. Welcome everyone to this webinar where we're going to discuss the details of Wellcome's new discovery research funding schemes. I'm really pleased that you've joined us today. My name is Diego Baptista and I work here at Wellcome as a diversity and inclusion advisor on our research culture program. My pronouns are he or him. I'm a brown man with salt and pepper hair and dark brown eyes. I'm wearing a black button up top and behind me is a prominently displayed mirror ball with lots of plants. Um, I'm really excited to introduce you to our speakers. Um, I'll call each of our speakers in one by one and I will ask them to share their video, say your name and your role at Welcome, your pronouns, a brief visual description of yourself. So Michael, can I ask you to turn your camera on and introduce yourself? Hello everybody, um, my name is Michael Dunn. I am Director of Discovery Research at Wellcome. I'm a tall Irish man um, uh, and I've got short dark hair and blue eyes and I have a picture of a Madonna behind me um, in, which is from, uh, the, uh, from the, the National Gallery. Um, thank you. Thanks Michael. Alison, can I ask you to turn on your video and introduce yourself? Hello everyone, uh, my name is Alison Fox. I'm the Director of Research Funding uh, at Wellcome. I am a white woman. I have uh, shoulder length uh, blonde hair. I'm wearing glasses and I'm sitting in a very plain white walled room. Thanks Alison. Anne, can I have you come in and introduce yourself? Hi Diego, thanks very much. Hi, I'm Anne Taylor. I'm Associate Director Funding Operations and Governance. I'm a white woman with collar length curly brown hair, increasingly going grey. I'm wearing glasses and I've got a blue and pink floral top with a blue cardigan on. Thanks Anne. And last but not least, Jim, can I ask you to turn your video on and introduce yourself? Hi everyone, I'm Jim Smith. I'm the Interim Director of Research Programs. I'll be in this uh, job for two more weeks and then my place will be taken by Gerald Moore. Um, I'm an oldish white man. <laughs> I've never described myself as an old white man before, but that's what I am, with a grey beard and grey hair. Um, he, him, and um, I'm wearing a grey pullover. I'm a very grey. And behind me, I can see uh, bookshelves and pictures on the walls and coats hanging up. So um, thank you very much for joining us. I'm very much looking forward to this. Perfect, thanks, Jim. Um, so before we actually get started, um, I'm gonna go through some housekeeping. Um, so firstly, you can access closed captions with the settings function in BlueJeans. Um, this will be in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Um, there's also a link that is shared with you for live captions for the event throughout the rest of it. Um, we will have slides today, as you can see. If you hover over your screen, there should be a little slider where you can change the size of the slide itself versus um, the size of the video. Um, and then at the very end, we'll go into a Q&A where over 200 of you sent in questions before the session, which we're super grateful for. Um, I'll be managing how our questions get answered. We've tried to group them into themes and then we'll have everybody come back on um, to answer those questions. Um, so why don't we get started and Michael can I ask you to come back on where you will describe the vision of our new schemes. Thank you very much um, and it's not at all daunting to be talking to 3,000 people on this webinar um, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of a sense of kind of how we got here um, with our new discovery schemes 
um, and to give a little bit of a flavour of what it is that we're looking for um, from, from these schemes and from you. So I think it's fair to say that um, you know, over the years, one of Wellcome's major founding principles has been that science is essential to improving health. And I think we'd all agree over the events of the last year, that's really a statement that's never been more true. Our funding for in Wellcome has established, uh, had um, substantially increased really from the 1980s. And, and I guess since then, a lot of things have changed. The world has changed, science has changed, and Wellcome has changed. And I think what we want to do now is to ask how best and Wellcome ensure that its support for science has the greatest impact on human health. And that's why we embarked on a major strategic review. So Jim, who you all have um, just met in the introductions, um, led on the development of a new strategic direction for Wellcome. And this began with asking how Wellcome funded science might best achieve Wellcome's mission. And the aim was to try to create a single highly focused strategy for our whole organisation. And that strategy was to have science at its very heart. The review was launched back in 2018, and as part of it, Jim and his team really consulted very widely and broadly, um, both within the Wellcome family, but also a lot of people that we haven't funded and people from all sorts of different health-related walks of life. We spoke to people from very many different career stages and from different countries. And we tried to ask ourselves the question of really where should Wellcome be in 10 to 15 years time and what are the major scientific and health challenges that we should be seeking to overcome. So the outputs of that review really resulted in two quite different but complementary approaches to supporting science. The first is that we will support a broad foundation of discovery research. That's research in search of the unanticipated benefits which come from curiosity-driven research. And alongside discovery research, we will also support three challenge-led programmes which have specific long-term outcomes that will take a proactive, coordinated and directed approach to tackle some of the most important threats to human health. So that's mental health, infectious disease and climate and health. I should at this point say that alongside discovery research and the health challenges is our commitment to improving research culture. And this is actually going to be embedded and important um, in everything that we do. Then this speaks to um, issues of um, diversity and inclusion. And our desire that science as a career really is open to everyone. So next slide, please. So if we can turn now to discovery research, um, all of the conversations that the review team at Wellcome had um, led us to, to really make a clear commitment and, and, and uh, understanding that advances in health can come from unexpected sources. And indeed, a large number of health interventions have in the past come from basic curiosity-driven fundamental research which is aimed at solely understanding how life works. Now, as other funders invest less into discovery research, I think it becomes even more important than ever for Wellcome to contribute to knowledge and understanding, and thereby not only solve our own health challenges, but actually challenges that are much broader um, and relate to all areas of health and well-being. So we want to provide the best scientists in both clinical and non-clinical research and in humanities and social science with the freedom to be able to ask really exciting questions. Um, so we're funding discovery research and we want that discovery research to achieve significant shifts in understanding that could lead to improved human health through new insights and potentially new tools that open up new avenues for researchers to explore. In many ways, discovery research could be seen as an, an evolution of previous welcome funding, and I think it is to some extent, but we have given a lot of thought to the schemes um, that we will need to deliver welcome's vision and ambition. 
And we really want to be much bolder and more ambitious in our offering. So we really want the research that we support to have the potential to push the boundaries of our existing knowledge or push the boundaries of the techniques or tools um, and help to kind of venture into the, in the, in the unknown, if you like. Um, and we want the, our research to be really visionary and, and, and creative in that respect. And as part of that, we want to give individuals and teams the freedom to pursue innovative and bold research. Um, and we want to do that by moving towards increasing the level and length of support for researchers in our portfolio and try to shift the balance of our funding um, to researchers who are a little bit earlier on in their careers. We are being explicitly broad in outlook, so we want to be open to all disciplines that could benefit our strategy. So that means, I think, walking the walk when it comes to talking about interdisciplinarity and being open to other disciplines. And I also really want to highlight the importance that tools and technologies will play in our new strategy. It's an explicit outcome that we're looking for, um, and we recognise that these things can fundamentally change all fields of research overnight. And I don't think in the past we've done a really we've done enough um, in terms of supporting that kind of research. So one of the big changes, I guess, in, in welcome strategy has been that the creation of the three health challenges. And those health challenges span all the way from basic discovery through to policy, practice and interventions. Whereas discovery research is explicitly broad. So we can't hope to have um, translational impact across the whole of biomedicine. I think we are hoping to have it within the health challenges. But for discovery research, we are really trying to focus on the fundamental research questions, which um, are going to drive our understanding of biology and of health and well-being. So I think this has implications for um, translational research in terms of discovery. Um, uh, in the future, we will not be supporting um, some of the kind of the, the more uh, translationally focused research, where the outcome is explicitly an intervention or um, or some drug discovery. Um, but of course, we will be able to and want to continue support research which uses human participants, such as in, in experimental modes. So discovery is broad. The health challenges are very um, uh, deliberately designed to go all the way from basic understanding through to translation and health impact. So I think we could turn to now to some of the specifics of the schemes, and I'm, I'm going to hand over to Alison Fox to take you through that. Uh, thank you, Michael. Um, so the full details of the schemes uh, were released um, a couple of weeks ago. So I'm not going to run through everything there, and we can cover lots of the uh, questions that have arisen um, in the Q&A at the end of this uh, webinar. So I'm just going to give uh, a bit of an overview of the three schemes. Um, as Michael says, we, in thinking about the schemes and, and how to approach uh, discovery research, um, we, we drew upon everything that we heard during our science review in consulting with the research community. And we put that together with what Wellcome also wants uh, from uh, its uh, discovery research. And that's things like a broader discipline set, that is that discoveries that could impact uh, human health can be serendipitous. They can come from different types of disciplines. So we wanted to make sure that we could accommodate that sort of research as well. And we really want to make sure that we can accommodate interdisciplinarity and team-based research. A big thing that came out from the science review was the issue of flexibility, duration, getting off of the, the treadmill of constantly writing uh, grant applications. And as Michael says, a little bit more of an emphasis towards uh, that mid-career stage. So what we've aimed for here is to greatly simplify, simplify the set of schemes that we have. 
Those of you that have been familiar with Wellcome in the past will know that we've had innumerable different uh, funding schemes covering different disciplines, different geographies, career stages. So we really wanted to simplify those down um, so that it can cover a broader discipline um, set, if you will. The basic eligibility for uh, the discovery research schemes remains the same. That's the UK, the Republic of Ireland and low and middle income countries. But it's really important to note that those based in the team can come from anywhere in the world, as is currently the case with our collaborative awards. Can I go on to the next slide, please? So very briefly then, these are the three discovery research um, open mode funding schemes. We have the Early Career Award, which, as you might guess, is for early career researchers. And these are for the researchers who are really ready to establish their research identity, to begin to build uh, their research capabilities, and by the end, to position themselves so that they are ready to lead an independent program of research. Early career award holders will have their salary uh, paid for on the grant. They can request research expenses for up to around £400,000. And these awards will be for up to five years. The career development awards are for those mid-career researchers. And this is a broad, um, broad set. We, we recognise this. But these are for those researchers who have um, established their independence and they're really ready to drive innovative programs of research and have the potential to become our international research leaders. Again, you can have your salary on these grants, what we called the fellowships in, in the previous world. But we're recognizing that for some disciplines, people may reach um, that independence slightly earlier within their career stage. And they may have already obtained a permanent position in a university. So you can apply for one of these grants if you are within the first three years of your first um, permanent position. We haven't set a defined limit um, in terms of sums on these grants, but we just encourage people to request the resources that are required for their research program. Be bold, be ambitious, but also be realistic. Those resources, as ever, will need to be justified in the grant application. And these grants can be for up to eight years. So that's longer than we've had previously. That's not to say that they have to be eight years and it will be dependent on the research program that you envisage and also the discipline that you are uh, within. And then finally, there's the Discovery Award. And this is for researchers who are already established in their career uh, and in their institutions. And we want these awards to give researchers the freedom to pursue bold and creative ideas, which have the potential to deliver significant shifts in understanding and to impact our human health. Uh, again, we haven't set a resource limit um, on these grants, but we encourage you to request what is needed for this research uh, programme. Again, they can be up to eight years. They don't have to be eight years. That will be dependent on the research uh, and the discipline. But we do envisage these grants uh, being, or the research being funded through these grants, being uh, bold and with the potential to have a really significant impact. Discovery awards may be for one person. They may be for two people. They may be for a team uh, of researchers. It's what's needed to really execute uh, that ambitious program of research. Um, as I said earlier, the eligibility, uh, the geographical eligibility hasn't changed. So it's the UK, low, low and middle income countries and uh, the Republic of Ireland. We really do encourage researchers who have taken a career break um, for whatever reason that may be, who may have worked in a different sector and would like to come back to uh, basic uh, research, for example, do come and apply for these schemes. Whether it's the Early Career or the Career Development Award, it will be a matter of judgment for you, um, essentially for when you left uh, your um, research career previously. And as currently, um, any of these grants may be taken part time. Uh, next slide, please. 
just a, a little bit about the application process. And I know that many of you will be very keen to know the details of this, and we'll be releasing more information uh, in the coming weeks. What we envisage is three rounds of applications a year for all of the schemes. Um, the schemes will open to applications uh, at the end of August, beginning of uh, September. They may be slightly staggered with the early career at a different time point to the, mid, uh, to the Career Development Awards and the Discovery Awards. The application deadlines will be at the end of October, beginning of November, and the first decisions will be at the end of April or May um, next year, 2022. Um, the assessment process we've looked at in detail. We haven't changed the basic process, the workflow, that much, but we've looked at every element uh, very, very carefully. We are going to continue with uh, the process of shortlisting all applications um, by um, subject area panels, expert panels. Those applications that are shortlisted, we will then obtain an expert written review, as we do now. And then um, for those shortlisted uh, applications, we'll be inviting those into interview, where the final recommendation will be uh, made. The final decisions will be made by Discovery Research, by Michael um, and his team, drawing upon all the information and the recommendations that have been provided by our um, expert reviewers. Uh, the interviews we foresee being in person as long as the COVID restrictions allow, and I think we're all hopeful that that can happen. And for all of this process, we look, we've looked really, really carefully to make sure that they are equitable, that they're accessible to all types of researchers, and to uh, remove any uh, risk of bias uh, from the process. The assessment criteria will be uh, common across all of the schemes, um, and that will, will be looking at the research proposal, we'll be looking at the research outputs of the applicant or applicants, and we'll be looking at the research environment, both the research environment that the applicants are in and their influence and impact on their local research environment. Um, I think that's all I have to say at the moment, and I think we can probably move on to questions, Diego. Perfect. Thanks so much, Alison, and thanks, Michael. Um, that's a really helpful overview of the new schemes. So, as Alison mentioned, we will move on to questions. As I mentioned in the beginning, we received or we asked you all to input questions before this webinar, which was really helpful, and thanks for everybody who did that. Uh, we received more than 200 responses before the session, and we've tried our best to group them into themes. Um, so, can I ask all of our speakers to share their video again? Perfect, everybody's here. Um, so why don't we get started on the next slide. Um, the first question is, how do these new schemes compare to your previous schemes? Is there a like for like? And Michael, I'm gonna send this question to you first. Okay, so great question. Um, I guess the first thing I wanted to sort of say is that you know we're really very proud of the success of the schemes that we've run in the past um, and, and actually, the people that we have supported on those schemes. I mean, some of them all the way from PhD through to very senior positions. Um, so you know, people currently funded in Welcome Grants shouldn't be uh, kind of concerned about their status within Welcome, I guess, uh, is important to say. Um, you know, they should just kind of continue to do excellent work and they're just as important to us um, as the people we will support with these new grants. But in terms of mapping and um, the old world onto these new schemes, I mean, I think there are obvious similarities between the old schemes and the new ones. But I think, as been has been mentioned both um, by Alison and myself earlier, you know, it's a much more simplified approach. Um, you know, there's a longer duration of funding um, possible, and um, which will enable researchers to become more um, creative. And you know, we're really encouraging people to ask very, very challenging questions within the research. Um, you know, it's, it, I think it's also fair to say that you know, we are really trying to encourage more support at earlier stages of people's careers. I think it's been clear to me over the years that you know, people, people are having to 
having to succeed at higher and higher levels at each stage in the in the review process before they're competitive. And I think that's really very unhelpful um, and, and can lead to kind of quite a bit of conservatism. So I think we really are trying to you know refocus at that earlier stage so people don't feel they've got to be you know univer university professor stage before they're ready to get a kind of a, a, a career development award. So there are similarities, but I think you know, we really want these to be looked at as kind of a fresh opportunity for us to um, provide that flexibility, that freedom, um, and to um, and, and to bring down, um, uh, the, I guess, the seniority that people are, are are finding themselves in when they're at that kind of mid-career stage. Thanks very much, Michael. That was very thoughtful and thorough. Um, can we go on to the next slide, please? So the next question is, why have you chosen no more than three years postdoc experience for the early career award eligibility? Is there any flexibility around this? And Alison, I'll go to you for this question. Thank you. Um, always a difficult issue about setting limits and boundaries um, on any uh, funding scheme. It's important to note that three years is just a guide. If we don't give a guide, we know that we're going to get lots of questions, especially when we have one scheme for uh, covering such a, a broad set of uh, uh, potential disciplines. Um, so, so it's really a guide, and yes, there is flexibility, and we're not going to say if you're three years and two months, then you absolutely can't come in. But we do want people to recognize that this is um, a scheme for those early career uh, researchers who are ready to begin to build their own uh, independence, uh, ready to begin to build their own research identity, uh, a standard postdoc. Um, and so that's why we've wanted to give um, a little bit um, of, of guidance here. Different people are going to be at different uh, stages of readiness in their career, but for building towards their own lab or their own research group, um, if you will. Um, so it's not going to be a hard and fast rule, but we can't have infinite flexibility as well, actually. So if you have um, completed uh, your formal training for whatever that looks like in your discipline, it might be a PhD, it might be a period of uh, research training that doesn't require um, a PhD, and you've then done more research training, and, and you, you've done another formal period of research and then another, it's quite likely that this isn't the suitable scheme for you and that you should be thinking about the career development uh, awards. So this is really for those earliest career researchers uh, who have done well and who are ready to start building their own research group. Thanks, Alison. I really like that. It's kind of um, practical guidance with appropriate flexibility. Can we go on to the next slide, please? So this one will be for you again, Alison. Uh, for career development awards, is the three-year limit for researchers in a salary post fixed? Um, if I applied to Welcome, can I request my salary cover on my grant if I have a permanent position? I think this is probably a little bit easier to uh, answer. Um, and the three-year limit is, uh, is more fixed. We will probably have less flexibility around this. As, as I said, when introducing the schemes, we do know that in certain disciplines, the career trajectory is a little bit different, actually, where um, earlier in their career, people may be in uh, a permanent position. And this can be more typical in the social sciences, uh, for example, than in uh, the life sciences. So that's why we wanted to make sure that those types of people could apply. They would not normally be um, eligible, if you will, for a standard fellowship where you get the salary. Um, but that, again, can't continue uh, forever. So it's some guidance about who, um, who, who these awards are aimed at. If you have been lucky enough to get a position, first of all, well done. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you can step away from that position and then have your salary on one of these grants. We would expect the institution to um, honour uh, the contract that they've given you. So you may apply for a career development award, but the salary would still be coming from your host institution and we would be paying all of the uh, research costs. 
Perfect. Thanks, Alison. I think we'll fall into a similar theme again, if we can move on to the next slide. Um, and you mentioned this in the last one, but um, so if you fall between the Early Career Award and the Career Development Award, uh, which award should I apply for? I mean, it depends what we mean by fall between. We're not, we don't have strict time limits. So it's going to be a judgment call for you about where you think you are in your career, actually. Um, if you're a long time past uh, your, your, your training uh, and uh, your, your first period of, of research, it's more likely that you're going to be ready for the Career Development Award. So, so that's probably what you should be looking at. The early career is for early career. It's, it's a little bit difficult to know how, how more to, 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 to spell that out, actually. But that is what that's for. Michael, do you have anything to add on that? Um, not really. I mean, I think, you know, the, the thing is everybody's situation is going to be different. Um, and so really the emphasis be on, you know, you making those judgments, talking to your colleagues. Um, you know, the, 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 uh, there will be far more information on the website as time goes on. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and there will be instances where I think you will, you, you will need to talk to somebody in the office to get clarification. Thanks both. Can we move on to the next slide, please? So this one will be for you, Michael. And the question is, why are some current welcome grant holders being allowed to apply for a career development award outside of the eligibility guidance? Yeah, so this is a, this is a great question as well. Um, and I, I guess the best way of thinking about this is we are kind of at a period where we're going to be transitioning from our old schemes through to the And we thought really very hard about the responsibilities and commitments that we had made to the people that we had previously invested in, for example, the, the Henry Dale Fellows. And, um, you know, I think it's fair to say that those the Dale Fellows would have been reasonably expecting to be able to apply for either an extension, which is kind of part of the deal when they made their original application to welcome, or potentially to apply for a, a salaried senior research fellowship at the end of their grant. And so we thought it was you know, particularly unfair to kind of change the goalposts for those people. Um, and, and, you know, and it would be potentially damaging to those individuals. Abruptly take away the opportunity to apply for a grant with, uh, with continued salary support. So as I say, it's a transitional arrangement which will work its way through the system. Um, but, you know, the ultimate goal is to have you know, a pristine standard eight-year career development award, um, where the next stage is uh, the, a salaried post at a university or institution where um, you would be able to apply for a discovery award. Um, but of course, I think one of the important things maybe to say alongside this is that you know, in terms of the, the decision-making processes that we, that we come up with within Welcome, um, we need to make sure that those processes allow for the, uh, and take into account the different lengths of time that people will have um, under their belts when they're applying for these grants. Um, and I think that's um, and that's something that we kind of currently do, but I think it's, a, it's particularly important to, to mention here, because as Alison has said, you know, a lot of these schemes, you know, they're, they're, they're intentionally broad in terms of the, the, the jumping on point. Um, and so actually us being able to make those kind of uh, judgments in, in terms of kind of, I guess, productivity based on the length of time that people have had support, we need to make sure that we do that well. Thanks, Michael. And I know lots of people at Welcome are working quite hard on this at the moment, which is really exciting. Can we move on to the next slide? So this one will be for you, Alison. Um, if I submit multiple applications to the old and new schemes, is that allowed? And then will you consider my success rate from previous applications? So if you've applied to one of our old schemes and you were unsuccessful, uh, you're absolutely uh, allowed to um, apply for one of the new schemes. And no, we will not look at your success rate, if you will, for our previous schemes. So these are new, they're new schemes, uh, and we want them to be regarded uh, as new schemes by us uh, and by uh, the research community. So just look at stage. 
look at the uh, eligibility for the new schemes, look at the descriptors for the new schemes, consider whether you are suitable, whether you think, yep, that, that's going to suit me, that speaks to me, uh, and then apply. Uh, and we will not be uh, looking at any data to see whether you've applied for one of our uh, previous schemes before. You can't submit an application to an old one and a new one at the same time. Um, so, so I think our, all of our deadlines are such that that uh, won't be possible. But no, we won't be uh, looking at what you've done previously. Brilliant. That is super clear. Can we move on to the next slide? This one is also for you, Allison. So can I apply if I already hold a fellowship elsewhere? Uh, no. So, and, and that's because we're going to give you a lot of money uh, for this, um, and you're going to be proposing bold and ambitious research programs, and we would expect those programs to be taking up uh, most of your time. We're not going to say you can't apply it, hold anything else at the same time. So, um, you can be co-applicant on a, on a discovery award, for example, in, in due course. Um, but for the early career and the career development awards, we would expect those to really be um, basically taking up uh, the majority of your research time. Perfect. Thank you. Can we move on to the next slide? Again for you, Alison, when can I speak to someone about my application? Quite soon, um, as we get closer to opening the schemes, which are at the um, end of August, we're not ready just yet. Um, so when, when, where are we, April? Um, I would say probably towards June, that's when we'll be able to um, really uh, be much more open to, to speaking with people. But all, Depends what you want to know. We can tell you about the processes. We can tell you about eligibility. We can guide as to whether you might be suitable for one scheme or another. We can certainly tell you ed everything about the rules and what you can ask for and things like that. Um, but we won't be speaking with people about the content of their um, applications, actually. We, just, we want to be very um, equitable about the types of information that all researchers um, have access to. So I think some queries are already coming through to our information desk once we, uh, as we release the schemes um, a couple of weeks ago, um, and we'll be beefing up the level of support that we provide in the coming weeks. So I'd say by um, during May and certainly by June, there'll be much more people available to speak. Perfect. So watch this space on our website for more information. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? This one will be for you, Michael. So do applications through the schemes need to be in any of the health challenge areas? So absolutely not. Um, going back to the strategy, you know, there's a distinction between discovery and the health challenges. Discovery is intentionally broad. Um, so you know, I would be extremely surprised if the research that we fund through discovery isn't going to be important in helping to develop and shape the challenge areas. But that is not the primary purpose of discovery. Um, so I think it's fair to say that you know what we don't want um, are people kind of artificially shaping and changing their grant applications so that they kind of they it kind of makes it sound like that they're fitting the challenge areas. It, that will not be a factor in deciding on whether or not a piece of research is going to be funded or not. All we want is your best ideas, um, and the ideas, those ideas have, have the potential to change our understanding of life, health, and well-being. Perfect. Thanks, Michael. Can we go to the next slide, please? Perfect. So another one for you, Michael. Can you clarify what support is available for clinical trials? Well, I guess the first thing to say is that, you know, I think I maybe mentioned in the in introduction that, you know, the most clinical translational part of the, the portfolio for Welcome will be through the health challenges, um, because they are going all the way from basic discovery through to policy, practice and intervention. 
Um, and discovery research, um, we will be focusing on early stage discovery and not pure translational research. So I think the the, the clinical there will be so what's not in scope for us is um, research which is in there to create or test an intervention and that has a substantial clinical trial component to it. Um, but what we are interested in hearing about are, um, is research which um, potentially uses human participants, such as in, in an experimental medicine, um, uh, and, and, and that that research has to be conducted um, uh, in line with kind of welcome policies and guidance for clinical trials. But we will not be looking to support clinical trials with an end point, which is to um, create an intervention in discovery. Perfect. Thanks so much. And I think that ties in nicely to this next question. If we can go to the next slide. Will you fund translational research, including population health research? I feel like you touched on this, but is there anything else you'd like to add? Well, I mean, there are, I, you know, I know that there's a lot of population health research questions which are not, um, you know, purely about creating um, health interventions. Um, and so I would, you know, I would fully expect us to be, you know, we are open to everything. We're open to all good ideas. We're open to all disciplines. Um, and absolutely, we are open to population health research. Absolutely. Um, where I think we kind of have to be, uh, I guess there's going to be a judgment call will be on you know, the level of pure translation within those proposals. Um, I think you know, a little bit of translation as a kind of a, a, an offshoot of what is primarily a discovery grant is fine. But I think if it, you know, if, if the, the main purpose of that grant is to carry out some you know, major piece of translational research or an intervention, that is not going really to be in the remit. And you, you know, you'd be better off having a conversation with people um, that are involved in the in the challenge areas. Perfect, and um, we'll be quite clear about that when the challenge areas get sort of developed, and we and we announce that. Can we go on to the next slide, please? So this one will be for you, Alison. Are you discouraging applications for smaller, shorter grants? No. So not. we certainly don't expect every grant to be up to the limit of five years or eight years, uh, depending on the scheme. Um, and really, people should apply for what's needed for their program of research. Having said that, uh, for those of you that are familiar with the old project grants, we don't expect the discovery awards to be project grants. In fact, we don't want the discovery awards to be project grants in the same way that we didn't want our current investigator awards to be project grants. We do expect them to be, um, to, to be bolder than that. We do expect them to have the potential to make significant shifts in research. We don't really, we're not really looking for grants that uh, may produce an incremental uh, step. So we, we're not going to put limits on this, but we're not expecting everything to be eight years. We know that it will vary with discipline for sure as well. Um, so we, we're going to be very flexible with that and we will um, understand that those discipline uh, uh, changes. So I think like we, we know that it can be difficult to um, give a detailed articulation of a program of work for eight years, for example. And actually we know that it can be quite difficult to review that if there isn't a lot of detail. So that there are challenges that we and all other funders face with doing this. And so what we're thinking about, and we haven't got the detail um, finalized, is that maybe um, requesting a detailed program of work for um, say the first five out of an eight year program, but then more of the overall vision uh, for, the, for the final three years. And that's something that we will be um, putting uh, on our scheme pages and in our assessment criteria. Um, what we don't want, because of uh, if, if we get longer, larger grants, we don't want our application forms uh, to become big and unwieldy and bulky and huge. Uh, I've seen a few questions um, about that. 
So um, I think we were quite bold some years ago in making our application forms shorter, and we are going to uh, keep that the case. So we're not going to have 10,000 word research proposals or anything like that. We're going to keep them uh, much shorter um, and probably shorter than many um, other um, proposals. Um, and I, I have heard about questions about grants um, from other funders. We're not going to prevent people from, from doing anything. We know that uh, researchers uh, have to build their careers. They have to build uh, their research base. Um, so if you do hold a career development award, for example, yes, by all means, apply for a project grant from another funder or indeed be a co-applicant on a discovery award uh, from Welcome. But for any of these grants, of, of course, you'll just have to be clear and be able to justify and explain how you'll be able to do the research on all of it. So if, if you're building up a, a whole portfolio of grants and then you want a big one from us as well, then yes, we'll be asking how are you hoping to do this. These are significant grants and so we do expect them to have significant time devoted to them. That's really helpful. Thanks, Alison. Can we move on to the next slide? So how many grants are you anticipating that you'll award? Are you allocating certain amounts for certain disciplines? Michael, I'll go to you for this question. So thank you. Um, so this is kind of like the million dollar question. Um, and, and it really will depend very much on the number and quality of the grant application that, that come in through the door um, and the size of those the, the requests on those grants. So, you know, we haven't set um, we haven't set a particular number of grants that we're expecting to support, um, but overall, our spending um, for what was maybe previously science and humanities and social science will continue broadly in line with what we have spent in the, uh, over the last few years. Um, but clearly, you know, we haven't put a time limit on discovery awards, how the length of time that people um, can apply for those grants. Um, and we want people to be ambitious with their ideas. Um, it's fair to say that not all eight-year grants will be credible and justified. So I think it's important for people to kind of really think about the resources that they need to, to carry out the research that they want to do. So make sure that their cloth is cut to suit the task. Clearly, if everyone asks for the maximum amount of money for the maximum amount of time, that fundamentally changes the overall number of grants that we can fund. So that's a long way around about saying we don't know. We will we'll know when we kind of have a have run through the, the system a few a few times. But one thing is is for sure um, that we will not be ring fencing budget for different disciplines or different disciplinary areas. Um, and as we currently do, we will be focusing our decisions based on the quality of the applications that come in through the door. Thanks very much, Michael. Can we move on to the next slide? Another one for you. Uh, what PhD funding opportunities are you offering? So we are offering flexibility um, within the kind of the career development award and discovery awards for people to enroll um, one postgraduate research assistant at a time to study for a PhD. Um, so that's, uh, I think that's quite good that we're, we're being explicit about that. Um, and that kind of complements our, you know, our continued funding for the ongoing welcome PhD programs where, you know, uh, the, the basic ones, which will run for another, I guess, six or seven years. Um, and there's a clinical health, allied healthcare professional call, which is currently out. Um, and, and that's kind of our current uh, funding for PhDs. I think maybe alongside this as well, there might be a question about in different disciplines that people may well not have, have a PhD at that early career stage. Um, and we are allowing people to um, ask for uh, uh, PhD um, uh, support uh, for, their, uh, for their fees. Um, uh, for early career grant holders, but it's not a studentship award, but it's it's uh, being able to request those fees. Perfect. Thanks very much. The next question will be for you, Alison, if we can go to the next slide. 
So why is teaching buyout only being offered to humanities and social science researchers? Um, the short answer to this is that because that's what we've always done. Um, we've looked at this and we've looked at actually all of the uh, funding related policies that uh, we currently have um, to see whether they are still fit for what we want to do and will work with the new schemes or whether there, there is any change. So the humanities and social sciences have always had um, the opportunity to apply for just a small amount actually of teaching buyout. It's not um, all of their teaching by, by any means. And this simply reflects the different type of um, the, the, the different shape of the research endeavour in the humanities and social sciences and the different types of contracts that they typically have in uh, UK universities where they're expected to do uh, much, much more teaching. And the nature of their research um, is different. Um, it's often, it's much more frequently uh, where the, the PI is, is really, really engaged in doing the research uh, solely and it's very accepted practice that they need to step away from their administration and teaching for a short period of time to enable them to do that research. So um, we will be continuing with that, but we will also want to be clear that um, it's our expectation that all of our researchers do engage uh, with uh, teaching, as we know um, that they do now in line with uh, their contracts. We don't want to build into our research culture that you do one or the other in, in any way. And that's something that we, not, we do not want to promote. Thanks very much, Alison. It's very clear. If we move to the next slide, this one is for you, Michael. How will you support research enrichment, for example, public engagement for your grant holders? So thank you. Um, good question. Uh, so I guess the first thing to say is that Welcome is establishing a, a brand new kind of in-house team headed by someone called Dan O'Connor. Um, and that team is to focus solely on the research environment. So that's you know, issues to do with research culture, open research, um, and, and I, I guess kind of broader engagement with publics. Um, so research enrichment and public engagement is going to be a key part of, uh, of this, the work of this new team. Um, and they will be looking to develop a, a plan to support this in the long term. My understanding is that, um, uh, that grant holders are up until 2023 will still be able to apply for research enrichment based on um, their existing old style welcome grants. Um, but in the future, um, there will be something else that will come in its place details which will be developed over the over the over the coming time. Perfect. Thanks, Michael. Uh, so we have about five minutes left and a few more questions. I think we'll be able to get through all of them and then I'll kind of close out the session. Um, can we move to the next slide, please? So another one for you, Michael. Are you still planning to fund infrastructure and resources beyond these schemes? So one of the things that um, Jim's uh, review uh, highlighted was the importance of uh, resources as enablers of research, really important enablers of research. Um, but the review itself concluded that running an open mode grant scheme may not be the best way of welcome making an impact in terms of these kinds of resources. So we're going to be looking quite hard over the over the coming months at how we might be able to direct funding for resources in the future. So it's a little bit more deliberate and a little bit more thought through. Um, so while we may not have an open mode support those uh, resources, which we maybe had done in the past through the biomedical resources grant scheme, um, we foresee some ability for welcome to support those kinds of activities. But I think there is a benefit to us doing it in a more deliberative way in the, um, you know, the, the, this whole kind of you know, thorny problem of sustainability, long-term viability, I think we can kind of deal with that up front um, and uh, in, a, in a kind of a very, very real way when we do this kind of strategic approach to supporting these kind of resources. That's perfect. Thanks, Michael. 
And we'll move on to one more for you, Michael, which is, why do you think it's necessary for researchers to spend time away from their home institution? Well, I think this is a good one to clarify, because I think, you know, it's what we really think is important is for researchers to be able to have the freedom to establish their own identity away from the environments in which they've trained. So, you know, we're not expecting necessarily for researchers to move universities. That may not be possible. It may not be desirable for those people. But we do want them to be able to spread their wings in some way um, and to have the I have that freedom to kind of establish that kind of sense of independence. Uh, and so, you know, I think what we're trying to do is to make sure that people know that if they are a postdoc in somebody's lab, that if they're sitting in that same lab in the same kind of way, it, it's going to become very difficult for them to establish their own identity. So we're just asking for people to kind of think about how best they can do that. And, and I think the environment is kind of one part of that. Um, it doesn't have to be moving city, but I think it does have to be moving out of that direct, uh, I guess, direct supervision of uh, of your previous supervisor. Excellent. Thanks, Michael. And we'll go to the last question, which is um, close to my heart, and I'll ask you, Alison, um, how will these <laughs> schemes impact or positively influence research culture? I should throw this back at you, Diego, if it's close to your heart. Um, so, so I'm going to hark back to something Michael said a little while ago, introducing our new Department of Research Environment, which will be led by Dan O'Connor. Um, and that's to recognise that research culture, uh, impacting research culture, cannot be met through these schemes alone. Um, they can certainly contribute it, but it really is a, a bigger piece of, of work, much of which will require us to uh, us welcome to work with um, uh, institutions and make our wishes, expectations uh, sometimes uh, known there. But there are a few things uh, through the schemes that we will hope will influence uh, research uh, culture. Firstly, we will continue with our um, expectation that institutions provide mentorship and sponsorship for the um, early career and the career um, development uh, awards. Um, in assessing applications, we will be looking at research environment, research culture, um, as I mentioned at the beginning when going through the slides. Um, and that's both the environment that the researcher is in, but also their contribution to their local environment and what they've done. And that may be um, their management, their leadership, appropriate to career stage, um, of course will be asking about that in that application um, and uh, in the uh, interview uh, process. We will be requiring institutions to allow um, a certain amount of days per year for all researchers on our grants to engage in continual professional uh, development. And that will be an absolute requirement. I think we've said 10 days, uh, but don't quote me on that. Having gone public with that, I probably will be quoted. Um, we will um, allow for, um, we will pay for the costs of CPD for continual professional development where those um, courses, uh, where that training is not available within an institution, a researcher can request it on a grant and we will uh, pay for that. We will be expecting institutions to either commit to a position or at least to commit to having a, uh, a formal review during uh, the course of a career development award so that that award holder knows that there is either a post or there is a path to a post um, during uh, by the end of their grant or shortly thereafter. Um, and finally, um, just to mention now, um, I've seen some questions about senior postdocs and can they be co-applicants. And that's something that we also want to do is to make sure that we recognize all um, people who are having a significant contribution, not a minor contribution. But if there is a senior postdoc who is helping to write a grant, who has helped to shape uh, the program of research, who is going to have significant input in running that program of research, then yes, they should be a co-applicant 
and they will be recognized as such on one of our grants. So that's just a flavor of the sort of things that we'll be doing for research culture. That is excellent and a variety of flavors that I think are really attractive. Um, so I'm really sorry if we didn't get to your particular question and if it wasn't answered. I know people were putting questions in the live Q&A and I'm really sorry that um, we couldn't monitor those during it. Um, if I could go to the next slide and then direct people to our schemes page if you have more questions that you'd like to submit. Um, and that's how you'll be able to sort of contact the team. Um, I'll just take a really brief moment to again thank all of our speakers. So thanks Allison and Michael for answering questions so thoughtfully and for Jim and Anne to sort of be back up in case we had technical difficulties. Uh, thanks Russell and Catherine for signing the entire session. Um, and thank you very much to everybody who's sort of been working behind the scenes that has made this run really, really smoothly. Um, I hope you're as excited about these new schemes as I am and I hope that you'll stay tuned to our website and our social accounts for further developments um, in discovery research and welcome strategy. So thanks everybody, enjoy the rest of your day.